Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I, I'm still thinking about that beer um, floats. So <laughs> I don't think it sound very good. Um, OK, Steven Bergstaller is joining us live tonight. Thank you, Steven, wherever you are. Um, we appreciate it so much that you're sharing with us. Um, he is speaking on the art of seeing in photography learning to see creatively, which is right up my alley. Um, and um, this is from the MailChimp, but parts of it sound so interesting. Um, to see, we must forget the name of the thing we are looking at. That's a Claude Monet quote. Looking is not the same as seeing. We are all unique. We see the world in different ways. Photography is a medium for visual communication, a universal language that transcends spoken languages. Photography is a human language. Learning to see and use our cameras to express our way of seeing is a characteristic of great photographers throughout history. Included in the presentation is learn to see and not just look, practical advice for creativity, Remove hindrances to seeing. One page here. And learn how to use different focal links creatively. He's originally from Grand Rapids, and Stephen is based in Cape Town, South Africa. His self taught photographic journey began in 2014 in preparation for a trip to Senegal. Reading books about art and photography is one of his main sources of inspiration. Stephen's current passion is street photography. His work has received numerous awards in international and national exhibits, including second runner-up in the 2021 Marik Brewer Award for Visual Art and has been exhibited by FIAP at the United Arab Emirates Exhibition. He's published in several magazines and newsletters. Stephen has a passion for evaluating phot photographic images and has presented to the Photographic Society of America on the subject. So um, there's more to this. I want you to check out the website or the MailChimp and see what he does. And Stephen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, Stephen, um, if you could okay. share your screen. We'll I believe see. you can see it now, is that correct? No, we cannot. Oh, okay. One moment. Here we go. Okay. I want to be in the... How's that? <laughs> okay. But... Oh, how... How do I side by side view? Right? Is that what I want? That what want? That's what I did last. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. Um, and just just that. Okay, go. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share with you uh, this evening on this subject: the art of seeing creatively in um, specifically in photography, uh, seeing creatively applies to so much more than just photography. Um, Stephen, um, Stephen, yes. can I interrupt? Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing a, a weird thing on the left hand side of your, uh, it's like a dark gray box with hash, hashes in it. Is anybody else seeing that? What if I do this? There, now it's gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yes, that was the uh, that was the zoom window. So okay, thanks for mentioning for mentioning that. Um, basically, seeing creatively applies to so much more than just photography. But in this case, uh, this evening, I want to talk about 
the examples I plan to use and the techniques that I plan to discuss are, um, I'm going to use my camera and photography as the, um, as the, as the point that, um, from which I springboard everything. So, um, as a matter of fact, if we learn to see creatively, it just opens up a whole new world for us in just about any of the visual arts. So, um, so there's a real value to that. Okay. <laughs> All right. By way of introduction, um, the great photographer, Elliot Erwitt, he said, to me, photography is an art of observation. It's about finding something interesting in an ordinary place. I found it has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way that you see them. Notice little to do with what we see and everything to do with how we see. Um, oftentimes we forget it's not so much what we see, but how we see it. Uh, subject matter becomes subject to the photographer's way of seeing the photographer's way of interpreting, and also the presentation that a photographer would choose to use to, to, um, to display or to present their photograph. We need to take all three of these things into account. The seeing of that the photographer is showing us, the interpreting that he's made or she has made, and the presenting of the photograph itself. And we cannot separate those things when we look at an image. Photography is really a human language, and it is therefore universal by nature. Um, it's a medium for visual communication that transcends all spoken languages. And as such, photography is a way to speak without words. And if we're going to speak the language of photography, we must learn um, how to use the elements of visual design to build compositions in much the same way that we use parts of speech to build sentences, paragraphs, and even write books. The photographer uses elements of visual design to build compositions within the frame. And compositions communicate. The strongest images have something to say to the viewer. And so I asked the question, um, what do you want to say with your photography? And maybe you haven't thought about that before, but the strongest statements, are the strongest images have something to say. And one of the goals of this presentation will be to assist you maybe in discovering what it is that uh, you would like to say with your photography. Well, what is seeing? When we talk about seeing in the context of the visual arts and specifically in the context of photography, we're saying that seeing is really the art of observation. It is recognizing, it is noticing, and most importantly of all, it's going beyond our own preconceptions about things. It's having a fresh look. It's having a fresh perspective. It's, uh, it's finding a new angle. It's the art of observation. Seeing is what separates innovation from imitation. And as a young photographer, I joined the club and I began to imitate. Um, the other photographers in the club. And I learned a lot of technique by imitating other photographers. But there came a time when I, I was bored with just imitating what I was seeing. I wanted to innovate. And so um, I learned that the way I see things is very important to my photography. Um, 
question of motivation really becomes essential here. Like, why do you pick up your camera? Is it for an affirmation? Some people, they, they use photography as a form of affirmation to possibly get a gold star or another certificate. And um, I can tell you, I've, I've achieved many gold stars, many certificates, many awards, and they really don't mean much it, because you're always just looking for the next um, award or the next ego boost or whatever. So um, for me, it's my photography now is not so much about um, affirmation. It's more about expression. It's more about me as, a, as an individual saying what I want to say, whether or not a person likes it. Um, and that's important. I think we, we should check our motivations sometimes and just see why we do what we do. And remember that photography is not a destination. It's a journey. Um, and herein lies the joy in picking up a camera. Um, my standards have become so high that many times I don't press the shutter. I'll go out on the street, I'll, I'll spend the day, and I might end up with three photographs. And, um, but I had a great time. And even if I, if I don't have anything that I really am happy about, it's the, it's the joy of the journey. It's the, it's the practice of, um, of going out with my camera and searching for that next um, image. So it's important to have a joy in your journey, really, um, whether or not you are, um, are taking a lot of photographs or not, doesn't really matter. And keep in mind that you have a unique way of seeing. You're, you are a unique individual. We all are, and we see life in different ways. And so we must learn to use the camera to express our way of seeing, both visually and creatively. Your photographs tell me something about you. I can, they contain a piece of your personality, what you like how you see the world around you. If you enjoy, if I see a picture of a flower, they, then I know you like flowers. At the very least, I can, I can ascertain that much information. And so I'd like to make a brief case for seeing. And um, these are just a couple of the topics we're gonna go through this evening. And the first one is that we need to see without preconceptions. Preconceptions are one of the main obstacles to creativity. Now, there's a guy named Derek Dufinger, and he has a classic book. It's called The Art of Seeing. It's uh, the Kodak Workshop series. And don't get thrown off by this, but um, this quote is just amazing when it comes to preconceptions. And he says, Admit it or not, we all have preconceptions. We, have, we all have them, they're unavoidable. In the depths of the mind, they glide, unseen in the darkness, unheard in the silence, waiting. At the sight of a flower, a face, or any other photographic bait, preconceptions wheel in unison like a school of macro and carry you along unawares. Elusive, and intangible preconceptions always agree, always flatter, never complain, never criticize. They make photography a breeze. They free you from the sweat of thought, liberate you from the mental calisthenics that leave the brain weary, the mind sore, and the imagination puffing. Buoyed by preconceptions, we only have to pose the subject snap the shutter and pat ourselves on the back. Why evict such agreeable creatures as preconceptions? Because they inhibit our photography. And even as I was quoting now and reading this quote, I was reminded in my mind about what I call a Facebook fodder. 
if you really want to know something about your photography, the last thing you want to do is ask for advice on Facebook from all your friends because they will only like it. <laughs> they will only tell you good things about it. And so it will be almost impossible to grow as a photographer from Facebook. Okay, so we need to see without preconceptions and also jazz musicians. Why do they learn scales? Why do they practice fundamentals and technique? Well, they have a purpose. And that purpose is so that they can improvise. Improv improvisation is really the highest form of self-expression in jazz music. It's why they practice scales over and over. In the same way, we as photographers, we practice technique. Why do we practice technique? Technique is not a destination. Technique is a tool for a journey of expression. The more technique we master, the better we're able to express ourselves in our photography. And so technique is simply a tool. Um, a song is more than just playing and singing the correct notes. A song becomes great when the musician puts their heart and soul into the music. And so as listeners, we can tell if a person is just singing the notes or if, they've, if they're really putting their heart and soul into the song. And this same principle applies to our photography. Um, remember, improvisation is the highest form of self-expression, not just in music, but in photography as well. And we need to look until we see. Looking is not the same thing as seeing. Anyone can look. Um, seeing requires some mental time and effort. It requires that we work at it. Um, notice the image in this slide and what do you see? Um, do you see only rust and discoloration on an old automobile? Think in terms of a landscape now. Um, the title of this image is called Baobab Reflections. There's a tree in Africa. It's called Baobab Tree. And do you see the reflections? Claude Monet said, and this is so important, to see, we must forget the name of the thing we are looking at. To see, we must forget the name of the thing we are looking at. Um, this is sometimes why abstract photography is so helpful in learning how to see creatively. And so let's remove the labels, looking beyond the label of things, refusing to label things. There's a great Canadian photographer uh, by the name of Freeman Patterson, and he has a series of books instructional books. And so in his books, he, he has a term for this removal of labels. He calls it abstracting. And I think it's more of an art, artistically correct um, nomenclature. When you, this is called abstracting. In effect, you basically strip your mind of preconceived notions concerning the subject matter that's in your frame. And as a result, um, objectivity just happens. By default, you begin to see the shapes because you forgot to name the thing you're looking at. I mean, think about a landscape. There are some amazing landscapes. What are they? They're triangles, one on top of another that just really work out well. So um, you, can even, you can look at anything and just kind of abstract it, forget the name of it, and just look at the lines, look at the shapes, look at the texture, look at the patterns and so forth. Or the colors. We need to abandon our preconceptions about subject matter. Well, how do we remove hindrances and barriers to seeing creatively? I'll run through these hindrances and then we'll take any questions we have. 
so far. I hope you know about Ernst Haas. Ernst Haas was a master of color. And I first really learned about him in the Time Life series photography books, which I think are amazing even today. Um, he said, there is only you and your camera. The limitations in your photography are in yourself. For what we see is what we are. And I would say uh, that when it comes to photography, we can be our own worst enemies sometimes. The first hindrance is that we make rules out of principles. There are no rules in photography, only principles. Even what, um, I know you might say, well, what about the rule of thirds? And uh, I would argue that the rule of thirds is a general principle because it doesn't always apply. And sometimes when you, when you refuse to follow that rule, your image becomes more powerful depending on your subject matter. So I would consider the rule of thirds to be a general principle. But why do people prefer to make rules out of principles? Well, because rules can easily become a comfort zone for us in which predictable results can emerge. And why do we like pre predictable results? Well, because we're already living in the comfort zone, so to speak. It's like a vicious cycle. So, um, so remember, we're talking about principles here. It, and also, it's easier to follow rules than it is to, um, to follow principles. Because rules are easy. Principles, though, they require work. And sometimes it's a lot of hard work to, um, to follow a principle rather than easily following a rule. So to sum it up, I would say that rules can actually inhibit us in our photography, but that principles will guide us as we learn to see creatively. We need to wrestle with our preconceptions. Photography is often a conflict between the photographer and her or his preconceptions. And we need to be willing to do so, to remove the barriers, to forget about how things should look, to break old habits even. Um, once again, remember what Derek Dufinger said, why evict such agreeable creatures as preconceived preconceptions because they inhibit our photography. This is going to sound just a little bit radical, but I want it to sound kind of, I want it to be a strong statement. And that is that um, do whatever it takes to free your mind from preconceptions. A lot of times farmers will burn a field for the purpose of fertilizing it. When they burn the field, then the crops come in stronger and better afterward. Well, in the same way, we should burn our preconceptions about things and allow something new maybe to emerge from the smoldering ashes, so to speak. And disregard your past experiences and ideas concerning subject matter. Um, we've all seen a hundred images of flowers or maybe uh, Mount Rushmore. You've probably seen a lot of pictures of Mount Rushmore. So instead of saying, oh, this is just another picture of a flower or not another picture of Mount Rushmore, maybe what we should say is, wow, pretend like that's the first flower you've ever seen or the first time you've ever seen Mount Rushmore in your mind, just pretend. And notice anew the texture, the beauty, the delicate beauty of the flower. Or stand in awe once more of the first time you saw Mount Rushmore. When we, um, when we disregard those past experiences and ideas about the subject matter we're viewing, we enable our minds to see objectively. And by objectively, I mean creatively. Also, and finally, make a practice of awareness. Awareness must be intentionally exercised. 
at least until it begins to happen naturally. Uh, street photography is a great genre for learning to be aware. It's all about improvisation and seeing. Uh, learn to find value in the familiar. Move around your house with your tripod. Um, it may take a while, until you're able to make a strong image inside your home, but, but you will eventually. Um, making successful images of the familiar encourages us to reconsider our surroundings and to be aware. And awareness is a practice which takes time. So be patient in doing so. Okay, do we have any questions so far? Not so far. Shall I proceed? I'm unable to see everyone with my laptop set up the way it is. So if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and proceed. Um, well, it was off. Can you hear me now? OK, yes. Hi. There are no questions at this point, unless there's one in the room. Is there any questions in the room? No, nope. go ahead. OK, so Dorothea Lang said, the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. So an understanding of our tool, a camera, is essential to laying a foundation for seeing. First of all, notice how does the camera see? We see subjectively, but the camera sees objectively. In other words, the camera sees what we may overlook. So we need to learn to move and function between our subjective viewing and the camera's objective viewing. What, uh, what some people say is focus yourself before you focus your camera. Um, so basically begin to look at everything in the frame and remove anything that distracts from the message that you're trying to share with the viewer. Use the limitations of the camera as expression in your photographs. I mean, but the most obvious example of this would be learning depth of field, which one of the techniques that we learn almost immediately to, um, to open up the aperture on the camera in order to blur the background. Well, that's a form of expression. In the case of the image that's on this slide, my intention was to flatten the subject matter. I did not. I did not want any sort of depth within this frame. I wanted a two-dimensional image for the sake of the cityscape, so that it would consistently run through the uh, the image. So remember to use the limitations of the frame as part of your composition. When a frame is introduced into the visual world, immediately compositions happen. As soon as we begin to create any sort of frame, that, you know, that whole thing, we're including, we're excluding, and there is a composition, whether it's a good one or it's a bad one. So understanding that, um, there is an automatic limitation or restriction when we look through our cameras is important. Realizing that the frame is both including and excluding and orienting the viewer in what is the top, bottom, left and right, and using those limitations to our advantage uh, when we want to express our creativity. When we're talking about limitations of a frame, there are two aspects which 
are rarely discussed. And the one is focal lengths. And the second is aspect ratios. Um, does your creative voice have a favorite focal length? Maybe you could check your Lightroom and see which focal length is most common to your photography. And you'll find that you might have a favorite focal length. And then you can ask yourself the question, why? Why, is, why do I like 50 millimeters? Or why do I like 100 millimeters? Why do I like 35? And you begin to learn more about your vision and who you are as a photographer when you study or when you have a preferred focal length. Um, I'll tell you right now in my journey, like my favorite focal length is 40 millimeters. When I'm on the street and I'm happen to be doing a lot of street photography lately, if I see something that I want to photograph and I hold up a 40 millimeter lens, it's just spot on, just how I like it to be framed. The second aspect is um, aspect ratios. It'll play on words. So what is your favorite aspect ratio? Most of us were tuned into a, a three by two frame, a 35 millimeter frame, but our cameras can do so much more. They can do a one-to-one, -one, they can do a 16 by nine. And so discovering what aspect ratio best suits your style or your subject matter is important. So consider the frame and its boundaries as part of your composition. Don't disregard those two things. Um, it's not just the subject matter, but include the, the frame as part of your composition. And take responsibility for everything inside the frame. Uh, a lot of times I miss great shots. Why? Because there's one thing inside the frame that, um, that won't work. And in street photography, I don't edit. You know, I can't Photoshop it out like I can in with other genres. So the camera looks both ways. Um, there is a, a relationship between the subject matter and the photographer, and the camera reflects that relationship. At the very least, what you photograph tells us a little bit about you and your personality. So be intentional with your photography. You know, put something of yourself into into your images, into your photographs. What is visual exploration? Well, I just have a few points to keep in mind when you're exploring visually. Uh, this image, by the way, was down, was the Eastern Market in Detroit. And so um, I just happened to be at the right place, the right time, and everything was pointing to this dumpster. Um, photography can be work, and many people don't want to work at it, but oftentimes great images require a strong amount of effort, and um, so don't, don't buy into this fast food photography mentality. Uh, be willing to work hard at your photography, and what happens is that if we're willing to pay the price, that it becomes a labor of love and we enjoy the work. So we should, photography is work. So let's observe, observe with what could be in a scene, what it is and what it could be. We can look for interesting contexts, unexpected relationships, look for anomalies. Um, also be aware of meaningful mistakes. Oftentimes it's our mistakes that turn out to be our best images. So learn to be aware of those and observe subject matter both before, during, and after you press the shutter. Because um, especially in portrait photography, getting that shot after they think that you're done is sometimes a more candid and beautiful image. By the way, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you in this presentation, but don't worry, you can... Um, you can go back and watch it again if you're trying to take notes or that sort of thing. Also viewpoint. Viewpoint sets the stage for your composition. So 
Um, go low, go high, get closer, turn around, um, try a new angle. See how do, the, how do these things change the mood or the feel of the image? Pay attention to light and shadows because we know that photography is all about light. And if you're in a location and you don't know what to photograph, just look for good light. And when you find it, just follow it around and look for the next good light because good light makes interesting photographs. You can study light, but at the same time, you need to notice the shadows because it's the shadows and the light together that make shapes. And so you compose with both. And also just pay attention to elements of visual design, the different types of lines, vertical and horizontal lines, what, the, what types of effect do they have? Um, oblique lines have a dynamic nature. Uh, S shapes, textures, all these different things which create interest within our photography. And also don't forget to improvise. We don't wanna get stuck on a certain viewpoint. You know, our expectations when we're photographing should be fluid, uh, flexible, and we should be able to adapt quickly. Um, Keep an open mind about things. Maybe don't fixate on one subject at the expense of another. Hold on loosely. Um, why do we study technique? So that we can improvise. So let's use your imagination and um, trust your intuition. That's a big one as well. Um, when you have an excellent image in front of you or potential for a great photograph, you'll know it. It just happens. I mean, you, you'll, you won't be able to grab your camera and lift it up fast enough. So trust your intuition. All right, if a couple more slides and then we'll see if there's any questions. Some creative elements to consider. We're gonna talk about composition and color theory briefly briefly about expression, juxtaposition, and semiotics. So first of all, color and composition. Um, when it comes to composition, a basic understanding will help you to see more creatively. Um, look for shapes. Look for, I mean, in this image, we talked about landscapes a little while ago. You can see a strong rectangle just below the bottom third. There's a triangle of mountains. And then there's just a splash, you know, of clouds and so forth. So um, it's, I'm not looking at this so much as a mountain with a beautiful sky as I am looking at the shapes and how, when I, when I took this image, I was, I made sure to watch the waves because I wanted that line to lead the eye through the image, the line of the wave. So it's all about composition and lines and so forth. And whatever your subject matter is, there's a way to express it uh, well. And you use your visual design elements to do so. Uh, when it comes to composition, I, I like to say, does it feel right? Because sometimes we follow all the rules, but it still doesn't feel right. Uh, maybe break a few rules and then all of a sudden everything just feels good. It feels well balanced, it's working. So, um, so when it comes to composition, does it feel right? That's an important question. And when it comes to color theory, knowing your primary colors, oops, one second here. Knowing your primary colors, your secondary colors and so forth, complementary colors can be helpful in, um, something just fell here, in, in different scenes and so forth. So like, I was on the street the other day and I saw this um, young lady, she had the yellow and I saw the red, the red and I thought, man, I see yellow and red, but if only there was blue. And I, I moved closer and sure enough, she was wearing blue jeans. So then I, I quickly snapped the picture um, because I knew that red 
yellow and blue are primary colors. Expression. So some key elements to keep in mind. Why do I love photography? Because the camera is a tool for me. It's a paintbrush. The camera enables me to express myself without words. And so when you look at a subject matter, what are the characteristics of that subject matter that call for expression? Accentuation, um, emphasis. If you're looking at a flower, what is it about that flower that you really want to highlight in your photography? And then you choose the angle that best shows that area of interest. So technique, um, what technique even will best achieve the expression that we want to, um, to have in our photographs? Keeping in mind, What was the interest that caused you to stop and notice in the first place? Most of the time when we notice subject matter, there's some point of interest that grabbed our attention. And that interest is what we want to express nine times out of 10. Also expression before technique. I mentioned Freeman Patterson before, and he said that, um, a photographer should resist every temptation to codify the, the principles of visual design um, or to put technique ahead of expression. Now, this is a famous image by Diane Arbus. And without the title, it's, it's a powerful image. We don't know what's going on. There's a big question mark. And so sometimes a question mark creates interest in and of itself. But notice the technique here. It's not the greatest technique. I mean, if you look, there's kind of a person behind this young boy's head popping out of his head and so forth. However, there is so much expression that the technique just kind of falls away. I mean, this is one of the most famous images of all time. It's called Child with a Toy Hand Grenade in Central Park. So expression, remember expression should really speak louder than our technique. If our technique is speaking louder than our subject matter too, we're, we're losing, we're, we're not doing things well because our technique should enhance our subject matter. And juxtaposition. Juxtaposition is an, an act or instance of placing two elements close together or side by side. This is often done in order to compare or contrast the two to show similarities or differences. And finally, semiotics. Now, semiotics, the study of signs and symbols and their use or interpretation. So we look for symbols, we look for symbolism, and we explore the relationship between the symbol and its context. This image, I think, I entered it into my club competition in South Africa and the judge said something like, well, I should have cropped in closer to the subject, to the person. And um, I felt that if I had done that, I would have lost a lot of the overall message because of the symbolism that's included within the environment. So we explore the relationship between the symbol and its context or you could say between the context and, the sim and its symbol. Okay, this is our last section. So if there's any questions so far, we'd be happy to, to discuss them. Uh, there are none in the chat window. Is there, does anyone have a question here in the room? Not yet, so we can go ahead. Okay, thank you. How to use lenses creatively? And why does lens choice matter? Well, focal length, as, we, as we've seen, is foundational to composition. Choosing the correct focal length for your subject matter and also your way of seeing and your vision and how you want to express that subject matter, it's extremely important. 
that's why I like to include a subject or a segment rather of slides here that have to deal with the different vocal links and how they can be used creatively. So in order to learn to see, we need to have an understanding of how the lenses work and how they see. Lenses are like paintbrushes. You don't use the same paintbrush for every, every stroke. Um, knowing the characteristics of lenses that are in your bag, what are, how far can you push them? What are their limitations? What are their capabilities? Knowing your lenses will enable you to select the proper uh, paintbrush, so to speak, or tool for what's inside the frame. Um, combine that with your ability to see, and then you will have a freedom, a freedom of expression. So it's better to own one lens and to know how to use it than it is to own 10 lenses and not really have an understanding of them. And if your subject matter is a noun, then your lens choice is an adjective. Because as an adjective describes a noun, a lens describes your subject. And why focal length matters? Well, because not all compositions call for the same focal length. When you see a frame, you know which lens to grab that will best express the subject matter within that frame. And understanding how the various focal lengths work and what they're capable of and the unique characteristics of each focal length will enable you to give expression. So let's begin with wide angle lenses. Wide angle lenses enhance the foreground. And so if I'm looking at a scene and I want, and there's interest in the foreground, and I want to express that interest or somehow, um, maybe I want to blow up the foreground within the frame larger than it is in normal view, a 50 mil view, I would use a wide angle lens because wide angle lenses accentuate the foreground. Also, the wide angle lens is the only lens that's capable of expanding your horizons. And it can do so in a dramatic fashion. So the main advantage of a wide angle lens can also be its disadvantage. It makes the foreground objects larger, but at the same time, what does it do then to the background? elements within your frame, well, it makes them smaller. So oftentimes you see a beautiful scene and there's a barn and so forth and you put on a wide angle lens and now the barn looks like a tiny little speck in your frame. That's because wide angle lenses will open up the foreground and make the background even elements even smaller. So if you need something in the foreground to be in the face of the viewer, a wide angle lens is a great choice. Also, they exaggerate distance. So in this case, um, it's exaggerating the rocks in the foreground, but also if you're on the street and you see a reflection on the ground and you put your camera down to take a picture of the reflection, the reflection is going to be large within your frame if you use a wide angle lens, which is what you want. So that's wide angle lenses, standard focal lengths, which I'm going to use the 50 millimeter as an example here, because generally speaking, the human eye sees close to 50 millimeters. Uh, we call it a normal or a standard length. And Standard focal lengths enable you to shoot what you see in front of you without any sort of uh, distortions. And Henri, Henri rather, Cartier-Bresson, he used a 50 millimeter. So a lot of street photographers will use either 35 or 50 because those are standard focal lengths. And basically what you see is what you get, which is helpful especially if you're trying to compose. There's no tricks or no distortions going on, so you have to compose well. 
with a 50 millimeter or a standard focal length. The lens is not assisting you in any way. And so you have to be purposeful about what you're seeing and that forces you to be more creative. Also, you can play with the depth of field. A lot of times these 50 millimeter lenses have a very um, fast aperture, like maybe a 1.8. And for that reason, they're great for low light as well. So you can make silhouettes and play with the light. Telephoto lenses, on the other hand, they frame your subject without um, out of focus color. So basically, what? Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so you say you have some wildlife, right? And um, uh, it was warm. And I think, Mr. Glenn, you might want to mute your microphone. So um, if you have some wildlife, oftentimes we use telephoto because they frame the subject with out of focus blur. Um, also, they can be used for compression. You can shorten the distance between subject matter within your frame using the telephoto lens to compress the distance. And so oftentimes a landscape can be done uh, well by stepping back further and using a telephoto lens uh, because you're compressing all of the buildings and the trees and so forth and, and uh, making them look closer to each other in relationship than they really are. And macro lenses. Macro lenses tell a story and they show detail. Uh, no lens can focus closer. And many times what we see with the macro lens is um, often hidden from view on the, of the normal eye. So in this case, I think this is, um, I'm really bad with flowers. I love to take pictures of them, but I don't know them. This is an orchid. Yeah. So um, they expand our vision as well because they enable us to see things that we wouldn't normally be able to see. Also, having a macro lens will enable you to find subject matter anywhere. And a great photograph is never far away. So no matter where you are, you can find interesting subject matter with a macro lens. Now, fisheye lenses. First of all, um, the subject matter should be enhanced by the fisheye effect. Generally speaking, you don't use a fisheye lens for a portrait because it's just going to distort the uh, face of your subject. So um, make sure that your subject matter is calling for a fisheye effect. And you'll know it if it feels right, if it's working, or if it's not. Keep in mind that fisheye has the greatest potential for both positive and negative effect. Um, we've all seen many examples of fisheye gone wrong. And um, this lens should come with a warning label. And it should say not for general purpose usage. Or possibly a prescription should be required to obtain the use of a fisheye lens or maybe a permit should be granted only after a person has been trained, yeah, or dare I say a background check. In any case, I'm quite sure that I have personally made mistakes and transgressed with fisheye, but um, it's a journey. So um, we all learn as we go. Nothing looks worse than a fisheye used in the wrong way. But on the other hand, when used well, the overall effect can be dynamic and evocative. Okay, just a couple more slides. So as far as application or exercises for seeing, photograph a common space or subject. There are photographs everywhere, Freeman Patterson said. There's no reason to be anxious or apprehensive about missing a photographic opportunity when you realize that great photographs are all around us. As a young photographer, I used to feel anxious about getting missing a photograph or 
getting to the right place at the right time. And I still try to do all those things, but realizing that great photographs are all around us will be, can be a liberating experience. Uh, we, we just need eyes to see. Uh, the, even this image here was a bench um, in a town that I was traveling through and I just used my lens. I held it vertically straight down and I took that picture. So great photographs are all around us. Try breaking a photographic quote rule, but be intentional. So uh, don't just break the rule of thirds in order to do it, to break the rule of thirds, but make sure that the image calls for the rule of thirds to be broken. The subject matter calls for the, the rule of thirds to be, to be broken. Some subject matter looks good when it's overexposed. Some sub subject matter looks good when it's underexposed, but be intentional and make sure that it feels right. Also, just play. Pablo Picasso said that every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And so I, I would ask the question, when did we stop coloring outside the lines? When did we stop playing in the mud for fear of getting our hands dirty? There are no rules. We should experiment, we should explore, we should imagine. Photography is not a competitive sport. It's something that we enjoy, we should play and be willing to make mistakes and fail. Uh, we learn more from our mistakes, I know it's a bit of a cliche, than we do from our successes. Um, maybe you made a mistake, but does it work? And don't be afraid to fail. Don't be safe with your photography. Um, like step out of your comfort zone. If you want to grow as a photographer, you need to make a lot of mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not growing probably in your photography. So um, if you want to develop as a photographer, be willing to make mistakes. Also constraint cultivates creativity. And this is the less is more concept. May less equipment force you to become more creative. You can try to limit yourself to one lens or shoot in a different aspect ratio. I love to shoot in a one-to-one -one aspect ratio. I love the balances that can be created within a square. Try focusing on symmetry, shapes, or other, some other type of topic. If you think about music, some of the most popular and best songs have only three chords. But what makes them so great is the message. And so we don't have to be complex in our photography. Sometimes less is more and, and can be more powerful. Limitations will enhance your creativity. So make limitations a part of your routine and, um, and you'll find that you become more creative. As, as a young photographer, once again, I would, I would go on an outing with my club and I would have a bag full of lenses. Just in case I see this, I need a telephoto lens. And in case I see that, I need a macro lens and possibly a wide angle. And I would carry around this big, large backpack full of lenses just in case. Well, I don't do that anymore. If I know I'm going to botanical gardens, I'll take two lenses. I'll take my macro and I'll take my telephoto. The macro for obvious reasons and the telephoto in case I see birds. And even then I could just decide I'm only going to do one of those things. And so my bag has become much lighter as a result. Study photographers and photography, art and artists. Read a book about a famous photographer Watch some videos, go through some online training, familiarize yourself with famous photographers. You can even visit art galleries or exhibitions. I love the Time Life series uh, on photography. It's from the 70s, but it's still 
in some ways it's more progressive than what we have today. There's some great information in there. If you just buy a photo book of a great photographer and soak in the images as you look at them, as you soak them in, your ability to recognize and see will improve. The Freeman Patterson books are great for if you want to free your mind from constraints or rules and that sort of thing. And in conclusion, be confident in your unique way of seeing. By the way, this image here was a mistake, a product of a mistake I had made in Photoshop where I had a couple layers and I accidentally felt, um, was folding one back and I realized, wow, I can unfold this. So then I, look, I went out and I looked for a scene that would be enhanced by this technique. And so sometimes our mistakes can be really uh, like a blessing in disguise. But anyway, be confident in your unique way of seeing. Uh, if someone criticizes my work, I'm either most grateful because I can learn from that criticism or else it doesn't bother me at all. Because for one reason or another, I think that the way that I had presented or constructed the photograph is what I wanted from the beginning. So as you grow in your personal unique way of seeing, criticism has no sting whatsoever. Either it will be welcome because you want to improve and you want to grow, or it will be um, disregarded because it just doesn't apply. And so it doesn't matter what score you get at club, you shouldn't be discouraged because some of my best images did very poorly in the club but then I would enter them in international salons and they would win awards. So um, shoot for yourself. That's important, shoot for yourself. Um, also keep a journal, could be e-journal, could be a moleskin, write down concepts, potential subjects, anything you don't, that you will want to remember later. And remember that seeing is a journey and photography is a never ending journey, which is why we love it so much. There's always something new to learn, to explore, and we should let the journey be the destination and enjoy it. I am the host of a Creative Journey. It's a community of like-minded photographers exploring individual expression and voice through collaboration, activities, and events. If you're interested, you can sign up at uh, creativecostalphotography.com. And I wish you all the best in your photographic journey. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, we did have one question come in on the chat. It is, um, who was the last photographer mentioned? I'm not, I think it was with the books. With the, with the what? talking about the books uh, the one that i think with the books that you were talking oh, about oh yes that's freeman patterson i'll put it in the chat okay all right um could you get the lights for me um oops glenn miller just let's see you spoke earlier of principles versus rules are there principles that are near and dear to you on every shoot Talk a little more about those principles near and dear to you. Hmm. Hi, Glenn. So principles, I believe, are genre specific and also subject matter driven. So in this case, when I'm doing street photography, um, I follow certain principles of technique, but it's only it's really based upon my vision. So. I keep a very high shutter speed because I want to capture action on the street. It's more of a technique, but what happens is my eyes, I end up with some noise. Um, that's just one principle that I follow is in the street photography genre. But um, it, more importantly, I believe the principles are subject driven. So whatever your subject is, those are the principles that you would want to keep in mind. Um, 
with with flower photography you you really need a a blurry background background is so important with flowers it's almost as important as the flowers themselves and most of the time people have a very busy background but there may be a time where the a busy background would work too so um yeah i guess i don't know if that helps to answer some of the questions but it's subject matter driven certainly okay. other books um other books yes i would ask you what type of photography you like jenny because and i would seek out like masters of whatever genre you are interested in but personally i can recommend general series and that's the freeman patterson instructional series time life books on photography and then there's a what's called a basics photography creative series that you can get from amazon basics photography creative series and those are excellent they're they're published out of um, london yeah okay any questions here in the room where's my stop it's a recording here oh there it is okay um no other questions here well, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Stephen um, was the photographer of the year for Grand Rapids Camera Club in 2021. And um, he's, he, he's actually back in the States right now. Um, as you heard in his introduction, um, he, was, he, he lives in South Africa in Cape Town, right? Yes, mm -hmm. Cape Town, um, but he still has family here in the States and is back for um, a few months and um, we are so happy that um, he is so that he's on the same time zone and could, could yes. do a presentation for us so we and, and we had some other dates scheduled and then our our. Um, he stepped in at the last minute because um, the program that we had originally scheduled for uh, this month um kind of fell through and Stephen was willing to to help us out and and we are thrilled that you were able to do so so thank you so much thank you thank you grcc all right i'm going to stop the recording here and then um we have to switch computers to do the um or we can show it from here if you want. I could just uh, share my screen. Oh, okay. Yes, we can do it that way. Although, is it will it will it be better to have um, to have the HDMI cord?